So what do intermolecular forces do? Well, they allow there to be solids and liquids at all. That's what holds things together in so as a solid or a liquid. Other things that are um, effects of intermolecular forces are surface tension, viscosity, and capillary action. So we'll talk about each of those. Surface tension, surface tension is the tendency of liquids to minimize their surface area. It can be measured. Um, we're not going to measure it at all, but I'm just going to tell you about it. It's the energy required to increase the surface area by some unit amount. So water has a surface tension of 72.8 millijoules per square meter. Probably means nothing to you. That's okay. Here's a trout fly floating on the water. You can see how it's kind of distorting the surface of the water here. If you just are looking at densities, this trout fly should sink because it's got a metal hook in it. And metal is more dense than water, and so it should just sink. Um, there's also little water bugs that skate around on the surface of the water. They should sink as well, but they don't. It almost seems like there's a skin on top of the water. That's the surface tension. Water does not want to increase its surface area, and so it resists that. There's a limit to how much it can resist, though. That's the surface tension. So here we have a two-dimensional illustration of a liquid. And so we have uh, molecules at the surface. This molecule is having interactions with only four neighbors. The interior molecule is having interactions with six neighbors in this two-dimensional diagram. <laughs> in order for us to increase the surface area, we'd have to push some of these out of the way. We're going to create more situations where molecules have fewer interactions. That is, that requires an <laughs> input of energy. It's less stable. That's like the ball rolling up the hill. You have to push it up the hill. You have to do something. It doesn't want to do that. So when water minimizes its surface area, it, it minimizes its energy. It becomes more stable. Does that make sense? We want low potential energy. So back to this picture taken in outer space of this big drop of water. It forms that sphere because that minimizes the surface area and maximizes the interactions inside. And so that's a lower potential energy than if it's spread out. We can see this um, on our planet in tiny droplets of water that are small enough to not be significantly affected by gravity. And you look at those, and they're beautiful little spheres. <coughs> sphere is a geometric shape with the smallest surface area. So any question about surface tension? This, this picture, um, if you're careful and do it right, you can float a paper clip on water or a needle. If you want to try that at home, you could do that. Viscosity. Viscosity is the resistance of a liquid to flow. It's measured in uh, poise, which are one gram per centimeter times second. If you have a substance with strong intramolecular forces, the particles are bonded or attracted strongly to each other. It's going to be more resistant to flowing than if you have something with low intermolecular forces. You can think of this as the thickness of a liquid. You think about pouring honey, right? It's, it pours very slowly, but water pours much more quickly. While the, the forces of attraction between the particles in the honey are stronger than in water. And that's why it takes so long to come out. How can you make honey pour more quickly? Warm it up. When you heat it up, the particles have thermal energy, which is a form of kinetic energy, and they're able to break, partially break those forces and, and flow more easily. So viscosity is dependent on temperature. Um, it also depends on the molecular shape, because molecular shape affects the strength of the intermolecular forces. If we look at these um, hexane, I'm sorry, alkanes again, we see that the viscosity 
increases as we increase the length of the molecule, as we increase the molar mass. We saw that the boiling point also increased. Nonane has much more surface area to be Velcroed to other molecules than pentane does. So viscosity depends on temperature. Jump the gun on that one. Here's the viscosity of water at 20 degrees up to 100. We see that it drops from 1 centipoise to 0.28. So it becomes less viscous at high temperatures. It's probably not something that you'd notice like we notice with honey. Viscosity is really important in motor oil because in a motor oil, it, it's supposed to lubricate the moving parts of your engine. So it needs to be thin enough that it can flow around and get where it needs to get, but it also needs to be thick enough that it doesn't just all fall down. Uh, if you had something like water or alcohol, it would not coat the moving parts, and you'd be in trouble. So in the old days, you'd have to change your motor oil, especially if you lived in the Midwest where you got big seasonal changes, right? So it's cold in the winter. Well, when it's cold, things become more viscous. The oil gets too thick and it's not going to work very well. So you have to change to a lighter weight oil so that it'll move around. But that's not going to work in the summer when it gets hot because then the oil's just going to fall down and it's not going to lubricate your engine. So modern oil, mod, bleh, modern motor oils, that's not a tongue twister, have polymers. And these, these polymers are really neat. They coil up at low temperatures. So a spherical molecule has weaker intermolecular forces than one that's stretched out. So at low temperatures, where you need to reduce the viscosity, they'll coil up. As you heat it up, they unwind, and they become more attracted to each other. So at the high temperature, where the problem is low viscosity, the, the polymers uncoiling increase the viscosity. And so you can have a motor oil that's going to function over a wide range of temperatures. So here, this one, 10W40, it'll go from 10 to 40. So that's pretty neat. Capillary action, ability of a liquid to flow against gravity up a narrow tube. So here we have um, someone getting some blood drawn. You take this little capillary tube, and you touch it to the surface of the blood, and the blood just runs up the tube all by itself. You don't have to suck it up or anything. There are two forces that are going on here. A cohesive force, that's the attractions between the molecules and the liquid, and adhesive force, which is the attraction between the liquid and the surface of the tube. So the, the blood is attracted to the surface of the tube, and that causes it to creep up the edge. But it's also attracted to the other molecules in the blood, so as it creeps up, it pulls its friends up with it. It will only go up so high, though, because gravity is pulling it down. And so we see that the height that it will go up by capillary action uh, depends on the diameter of the tube. So a very narrow diameter tube, the liquid will climb much higher than in a very fat tube. Different liquids will go different heights depending on the strength of their adhe adhesive forces and their cohesive forces depends also on the material of the tube. There are some plastics that water is not attracted to, and so you won't get any capillary action. Water does like glass, and so it'll climb up the glass. The, sort of like what? Well, there's so many kinds of plastics. That, well, that not attracted to. Well, there, there are hydrophilic and hydrophobic plastics. So one of the reasons that you put wax on your car is to make your car hydrophobic, right? And so the water beads up. Why does the water bead up on a waxed car? Because the adhesive forces between water and the wax are, are very, very low. And the cohesive forces between the water molecules are high. And so it's going to ball up, make little spheres, reduce its surface tension. If you've got an old car like one of ours that, you know, is like... There's this stuff on it that reminds you of paint. And um, you get that wet, and the water just spreads out all over the place. The water is interacting very nicely with what was formerly called paint. 
right? And so it just spreads out instead of beating up. So it really depends. I don't know which plastics are hydrophilic and hydrophobic off the top of my head, but. It, it's mostly the chemical composition, yeah. And and plastics are polymers, and there's there's polycarbonate and polyethylene, and and then there's high and low densities and all different kinds. And they're they all have their own uses. And some of them will dissolve in acetone, and some of them are resistant to acetone. And so that's one of the reasons plastic is so useful, is because you can get um, the properties that you need. And then it's also nice that it doesn't break when you drop it on the floor. Yeah. We had some breakage yesterday. There will be some today, too, in lab. We've, we've observed this meniscus that water forms. And I taught you in lab, we, we always measure to the bottom of the meniscus, right? Well, what causes that? It's capillary action. It's capillary action. So the water has an adhesive force with the glass, and so it's drawn up the side. It's trying to do capillary action, but the test tube or the graduated cylinder is too large, and so it can't really get anywhere, but the edges are going to creep up. So we get this concave meniscus. Mercury, on the other hand, is not attracted to the glass and is very attracted to itself, and so it'll form a convex meniscus where it bulges up in the middle instead of going down. Yeah, I suppose on mercury you'd measure to the top of the meniscus. We spend so much time measuring. So, yeah, we, we spend so much time measuring liquid mercury that that becomes really, really important, right? Yeah. 